Yesterday, Sierraji spoke about three characteristics that the yogis should know about. First of all, sabhava lakana. Second of all, sankata lakana. And third, samanya lakana. So, sabhava lakana, the first. In one's stream of existence, in one's being, there are mental and physic- physical individual true natures are happening. Individual moments of mind and matter are happening. These are related as cause and effect. And, and these things which are happening are individual sabhava, individual true nature. And each of these has a start, a middle, and an end. This is called Sankata Lakana. This is a concept. This, this is not true nature, Sankata Lakana. This is concept, how they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's a conceptual a level of seeing. And the third, Samanya Lakana, the common characteristics that all mental and physical phenomena have. Having arisen, they don't stay that way. They pass away. And all mind and matter are the same in this respect. So among these three, to know sabhava, to know the individual true nature, to, do, to know this, you have to observe at the very moment of arising. Then one will know true nature for sure. So at the very moment of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, lifting, moving, placing, bending, stretching, blinking the eyes, opening and closing the eyes. At all these moments, there's mind and matter, nama and rupa, occurring together. And what they're like, uh, it's, it's just like a blind man and a crippled man going on a trip together. So the body, the physical stuff, doesn't know anything. Physical, phys, what is physical does not have any knowing. Nama, or mentality, cannot do anything. It knows, but it can't do. So together, the mind and matter, mind and matter, can work together. Just the way the blind man and a crippled man can go on a trip together. So the blind man can't see, but he can walk. And on the other hand, the uh, crippled man, he can't walk, but he can see. So he has to sit on the, on the blind man's back or on his shoulders, and then he can tell the, the blind man where to go. So the two of them, when they get together, they can do some, they can go, they can walk somewhere. Separately, they can't do anything. But the two of them together can go on a trip together. And this is the way our mind and body work together. Together they can be effective. So to know how these two work together, examine yourselves do this self-research but unlike the research we do in the world we don't need any instrument we don't need any external instrument all we have to do is when seeing arises we have to make effort aim the mind and observe effectively when there's hearing smelling tasting touching eating at any moment we, all we need to do is to make effort to observe, aim the mind, 
and uh, observe effectively. So this is this is our job. We just have this one job. And if instead of doing this one job, yogis do something else, then their work as a yogi will not be effective. So one should do this yogi job, this one yogi job, effectively. And if one does so, then beginning with purity of mind, one will develop knowledge and one will understand quite clearly how this blind man, the body, and the lame man, the mind, work together. So in order to understand this, one has to observe at the very moment of arising and see the true nature that is there. The Buddha gave a reliable method for us to use when we study ourselves. So this study of ourselves, before the present moment, Nama and Rupa was happening, but that is gone. That, has, that already arose and passed away. And so we don't see it anymore, what, what already happened, we don't see. What we can still know is concept or form, but this is not a reliable thing for us to study, concept or form. So with the method that the Buddha gave, we can observe at the very present moment. And this is what gives us definite knowledge. This is what is definite. So what we do is we observe what is happening at the present moment with our mind. And this way we observe what is definite. So what it is similar to when it rains or there's a thunderstorm. Uh, At that time, lightning may happen. And one can't see the lightning before it happens. It hasn't happened yet. After the lightning, one also can't see it. It's gone. But if one looks at at the sky at the very moment at the very place where the lightning occurs, one sees exactly what is happening. So, if we look before the lightning strikes, then we can only imagine what it might be like. And imagining in the practice is not an effective way to learn. So if one is going to apply imagination to try to learn about oneself, this is not effective and there's no need to come here if one is going to imagine. One can imagine very comfortably in one's own home. So there's no need to come here in order to do imagination. Regarding the past, it's gone. It can't be observed. Regarding what hasn't occurred yet, the future, it hasn't happened, so we can only imagine it. But, like when we look at the sky, right at the moment the lightning comes, we see the light created by the lightning. And we see that it dispels the darkness. That's its function. And we also see that it has a form. It may be jagged, look like fingers, and so on. So when we know one of these three things, when we look at the sky at the very moment the lightning strikes, we can see one of those three things. We can see the light. We can see how it dispels the darkness. Or we can see its form. When we see any one of these three, we are knowing the lightning. So similarly, when seeing happens, in the moment of seeing, in the moment of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, 
in the moment of rising, in the moment of falling, lifting, moving, placing, blinking the eyes, opening and closing the eyes. When something happens, we have to watch it. And if we do, just as when we see the lightning, we'll see the light. We'll see the d darkness is dispelled and we'll see the form. That happens because we look at the very moment the lightning comes. So we have to be alert and active in doing this. Our minds need to be active. It's not um, a place for being sluggish about, about it. We have to, and it's not a place for reflecting. This is a task for practical people, people who do, people who are doers. And based on, uh, one simply looks at oneself. So one has to observe at the very moment of arising and then one will see true nature. In Korea and China, there's a children's game that Seiraoji has seen. And it's a plastic uh, circle, like a plate, and it has holes in it. And it runs on electricity. And there's a little plastic animal, like a mole, a mole that um, when you turn the machine on, the little the toy on, these plastic moles start to come out of the holes in the plate and they pop up and the child has to hit the mole directly as soon as it pops up because that's the way to get points. Otherwise, if, the, if you miss the mole, then the mole, then you lose points. So the mole pops up and then goes back in and you have to hit it right when it's there um, before it goes back into his hole. And so that's, that's how to play the game. And it's similar to how we have to practice because just like the child has to focus his or her attention on the playing on this circle to see, to get the mole right when it comes up, the yogi has to put their attention on the body. And as soon as the object arises, they have to observe it. So what, whether it's rising or falling, uh, sitting, standing, lifting, moving, placing, whatever the object is, as soon as it arises, the yogi has to observe it. And in the case of the game, um, if one is too slow to hit the, hit the mole with a little plastic mallet, then uh, the mole goes back into the hole. So for us, um, for the player of the game, they have to put their mind, they have to put their attention where the mole is going to come out on the playing, on the little plate. And they also, to play the game, you also have to practice. And if you practice, then you'll be able to hit the mole as soon as the mole comes out, whatever location it might be coming out. So the uh, yogis from Korea and China understand this um, because they've seen the game. So uh, Seiraji also, uh, he doesn't know if Westerners have seen a game like this, but when he saw it, he brought one back with him from Korea. Uh, to demonstrate to the yogis about how one has to practice. And he tells the yogis, as soon as the object arises, you have, as soon as the mole comes out, you have to hit it. And just the same way, the yogis have to put their attention on the body. And as soon as the object arises, they have to observe it. So the yogi's attention always has to be placed on their body. So if in two weeks nothing special has happened yet in the practice, it's because one doesn't observe 
at the very moment of arising. One is not observing the object at the moment it arises. It, can also, it also means that when one performs activities like bending or stretching, going from standing to sitting down, sitting to standing up, those actions aren't being done slowly. Those should be done slowly like as though one is a, an invalid, a sick person. And it also shows that one doesn't value one's time. So understanding the benefits of this work that we're, we're doing, please do it respectfully. And um, Sayadawji has been urging the yogis to do this because the task is very valuable and high level. This task is a task that needs to be done with immediacy. It's the practice of satipatthana is not something that we can be slow about doing at all. As soon as seeing happens, while this seeing is fresh, one has to observe it. As soon as hearing happens, one has to observe it right when it's fresh. As soon as smelling, tasting, touching, as soon as these happen, one has to observe them right at that very moment. In eating, there's many types of activities involved in eating. Taking the food, chewing it, swallowing it. In touch, in terms of things that involve touching, this is the broadest category of all and includes all small actions such as blinking, opening, and closing the eyes. And with regard to thinking, there's many forms of thinking that can happen. Thinking or mental objects, imagining, planning, and so on. So every second there is something happening. And as soon as these things happen, one has to observe them. As soon as there is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, when that object is fresh, one has to observe it. So it's similar to how one has to hit the mole that comes out. As soon as it comes out, one has to hit it directly with the plastic mallet. So too, when the object arises, one has to apply effort immediately and aiming. One has to apply effort and accurate aim every waking moment. And one has to be ready to observe so if one doesn't value the task and wants to take a break from noting, then that shows one doesn't value the work. If one knows the value of what we are doing, then one will cherish the practice. So this practice is a method for becoming truly human to be able to keep one's mind humane and to be able to develop special human knowledge. This is something one can't get through any worldly means. One can't pay money and get these results. One can't get them through talking sweetly to someone. One can't get them because of being healthy one can get these through the practice. So if one is a human being, then it's very important to be a true human being and to be able to keep one's mind humane and to know what is really there as it is and develop special human knowledge. So one should calculate for oneself how important this is in one's life. At the present day, all over the world, moral behavior is in ruins. And especially this is true in technically advanced countries. 
So, um, in, con in technically advanced countries, Sayyid Oji has observed that personal morality has become very low. And th it's even true in a country like Myanmar, this uh, country. Even in a country like this, which is not technically advanced, and which has Buddhism as a base, uh, the morality is very, very low. So at, uh, in, the, in America, there's an American psychologist, Dan Goleman, who has practiced meditation. And he wondered, well, why is it that the moral condition is so bad among people in his country. So you know, he looked, well, there's scientific knowledge, economic, uh, economically people generally well off, health is good. So in all respects, all outward aspects, uh, people's situation on the whole is quite good. But in examining, he's, he found that because there's an emphasis on IQ, intelligence quotient, and a negligence of good personal behavior, because of that, uh, which, uh, which you could call EQ, or emotional intelligence quotient, uh, because of this, people's morality is declined, has declined a lot. So as a, as a person who had practiced the Dhamma, he, underst he understood the importance of good moral behavior and good personal qualities, such as knowing oneself. So uh, he did a study, he examined successful people, and he found that when people are successful, in only 25% of the cases that he studied, is, there, is this success due to high intelligence. In most cases, it's due to good personal qualities that he um, groups at, under the label of EQ. 75% of successful people are successful because they have good personal qualities. And so if more people would approach, um, if more people had the outlook that Dan Goleman does in the world, then there would be peace, there would be more peace in the world. Because this Dhamma is for making our own individual world peaceful. And when we've made our own individual world peaceful, from there, we are able to spread that to our immediate environment, to our family, to our friends, to our workplace. And if people in the world would do this, we wouldn't be turning to developing more and more new types of weapons. So, Sierraji prefers the term SQ to EQ. And to Sierraji, SQ stands for the trainings, Sika, the three trainings. So if more people in the world would work on developing their SQ, then the world would be very good. Among humans, there's no way in the world which shows us how to stay, uh, to keep from, uh, to stay kind of neutral, to stay without following, without going to, uh, from one extreme to another. In the Dhamma there is this way to keep oneself from going to one side or the other with whatever we encounter. 
so to um, to show you what Seroji means by this, just try to see what happens when you aren't aware of the object. Just try not observing the object. So what will happen is that when the object is pleasant, then one goes along with it. One gives in to it, one follows it, and that's called anuroda, going along with it. And if it's something one doesn't like, one will oppose it, one will feel opposition. This is viroda. And this, mostly people in the world are like this. When they encounter something they like, they like, they go with it. When they encounter something they don't like it, they oppose it. And people aren't able to keep from going in either of those directions. People aren't, being able, aren't able to stay in the middle. So that's how most people behave. But if when, one, when seeing happens, if one notes it right on the spot, when hearing happens, one notes it right on the spot, smelling, tasting, and so on, and so on then the mind will stop with mere seeing. The mind will stop with the stream of mind. So if we see something that we like and we go with it, we follow it, we don't use awareness, then what arises is greed. If we see something that we don't like, then what fo- without awareness, what happens is we oppose it, we react to it, and anger occurs. So this happens in everyone. Right? And if we give in to the things that we like and oppose the things that we don't like, we will not be, be able to control ourselves and we will get into trouble. So what we have to do is when seeing happens, we have to note it on the spot. With mere seeing, the stream of mind will stop. If we do this in the moment of hearing, when there's a sweet sound, a pleasant sound, if we note it right when the hearing happens, there won't be any giving in to it. There won't be any following it. No greed will arise. At the moment of hearing, when, we're, when, when we observe it right when it happens, even if it's a disagreeable sound, the mind won't oppose it. There won't be any anger following on that sound. So this is how the practice keeps us walking the middle way in between the extremes of liking and disliking, in between the extremes of greed and anger. So to develop our own middle way, the Buddha showed the method And this is what we need to do in the practice. We need to learn to follow the middle path so that we don't either give in to what we like or or oppose what we don't like. And if one follows this, um, if one follows this middle path of the practice, then one's behavior will be free of fault. At the moment of rising, at the moment of falling, when we observe at the moment they arise, if our mind falls on stiffness, then one knows stiffness. When the mind falls on tension, one knows tension. If the mind falls on movement, one one knows movement. So when knowledge arises, one should understand what is involved at that moment that one is able to observe like that. 
at that moment, the mind is focused accurately on the object. When knowledge arises, the, sorry, I, I understand what I wrote now. Um, when knowledge arises, there are other factors that are present that have come to completion at that time. And one of these is accurate aim. The knowledge arises because the mind is, is focused accurately on the object. And this is called sama sankapa, or right attention of the mind. And because knowledge is seeing correctly, sama deti. These two factors make up the, the wisdom portion of the path. And when every rising, every falling, one is applying effort to observe the object. Because of effort, sati sticks to the object. And because sati sticks to the object, the mind is collected, which is samadhi. So three, the three factors of the samadhi group of the path are also present right effort, right uh, awareness, right concentration. So at that time, there won't be any of this uh, going along with the object, which is greed. There won't be any opposing the object, which is anger. At that moment, too, the path uh, portion of sila will also be complete. One won't be engaged in killing, in stealing, adultery, or lying. So at this time in the practice, our physical and verbal behavior is clean. There's no transgression happening. With effort, sati, and samadhi, the um, there's no even desire to transgress happening in the mind. There's no thought about killing, stealing, adultery, and so on. So this clears the obsessive level of kilesas. And with the, with the wisdom portion of the path, the latent kilesas, the dormant defilements, are being uprooted in the moment so on three levels we are up, are eliminating kilesas. And at the rate of one observation per second, then in one minute there will be 60 times that this correct path, this eightfold path, is occurring. So at the moment the object arises, one observes. And in that moment of observation, the Eightfold Path is complete because the sila, the portion of the path relating to sila is present. The, the portion of the path relating to concentration or samadhi is also present. And the portion of the path relating to wisdom is also present. This is the forerunner path, the path that precedes seeing Nibbana. And in every second, this path, every second of observation, this path is occurring one time. Even if knowledge is not arising, the sila portion and the samadhi portion of the path are being completed. And when knowledge arises, the wisdom portion of the path is also complete. So, Look at your life when, it, when this is happening. This giving in to objects we like, the greed is not arising. The opposition to things that we don't like, dosa or anger, this is also not happening. So one, at that moment, one is walking the path in between these two tendencies, one is walking the middle path. And if one calculates, 
one can see that one's life is very valuable. Doing this practice elevates one's life. So when one works like this carefully, then in every second, there's sila, samadhi, and panya, these factors of the path. So each time, uh, sorry, the trainings of sila, samadhi, and panya are all present. And at this time, this basic human practice is being completed. So because people don't do these, complete these three trainings, because people don't practice what humans basically should practice, the world is as if it's boiling over. So these practices of the, the trainings of sila, samadhi, and panya, morality, concentration, and wisdom are very important for humans to be able to do. So they make our lives, our lives straight. Today, Sierroji has spoken again about the method of practice. And this is because in this 60-day retreat, one quarter of the retreat is over now. It's actually been 17 days. And there are some yogis who have practiced for two weeks now, but they haven't experienced anything special yet. There are some yogis who aren't behaving like true yogis still at this point. So in a place where one has to um, apply the practice, he wanted to mention again how to do the practice. And he spoke today about how the Eightfold Path arises in the moment of practice. When the Eightfold Path arises, this increases the value of what we are doing. This is a, an increase in value when this starts to occur. So if one works carelessly, then one loses this Eightfold Path. When one works carefully, then this Eightfold Path comes into being. And this isn't something that he made up. The Buddha, the Buddha spoke like this. So Siyadaji wants to say that uh, if you value your, yourself, if you, want, uh, uh, if you want something good for yourself, then please apply yourself to do this practice and work for what is really beneficial for you. It's not for him. The benefit that he gets from it is not... The, what, what he will get from it if you work hard is that he will be happy. But the benefit is what you will experience yourself. So he wants to urge you to work to get this benefit for yourself. And if at the end of the second uh, two weeks, if something... If, if, you, if you still haven't been able to develop the practice by that time, then it's better not to continue for the second month. So Sayadawji hopes, and, and he thinks, he hopes that you all will be able to apply the instructions for the practice with respect and care, working meticulously, 